everything we're about to say is a lie, so don't base any decisions on it. Um, we're here to tell you a few well-chosen words about Java, and particularly Java in a world of containers. So containers and clouds and microservices and all those buzzwords. Uh, managed to fill up the whole room just uh, based on those buzzwords, I guess. Uh, so uh, let's, uh, we'll go through a bunch of things, uh, 25 minutes, we'll try to sprint through it and hope for the best at the end. Uh, let's start out with on a high level, Java in a world of containers. So uh, in general, in a world of containers, uh, we expect uh, a few different things. So the first one is that we expect safety and security to become increasingly more important over time. Uh, both on like, you know, we've, we've seen both obviously on the software side, but more recently also on the hardware side that security, well, it can be a bit of a, a thing, let's say. Uh, so over time we expect that to just increase uh, and become even more important. Um, we also expect there to be a lot of sprawl. And what I mean by that, or sprawl, it comes in a few different flavors. The first one is that we expect there to be a, a large, very large number of instances. Uh, you basically are encouraged to create instances and create processes on the fly and uh, create a lot of them. Run more small uh, instances rather than a few large ones. So that's one of the major shifts we're seeing. Um, you, we also expect there to be a lot of different applications where in the past maybe you ran the same thing uh, over and over again. Uh, with containers, you're almost encouraged to create custom uh, containers and custom images uh, on the fly when you need them instead. So a mix of applications. Uh, we expect these uh, containers to run on a mix of different machines, heterogeneous systems, not all machines look the same way, um, and uh, also with different configurations. So uh, even if you, you, know, you can, and maybe in some cases it will help to create containers that look the same way, in many cases uh, you, you will probably tailor make them uh, with different settings and so on and so forth. Yeah. yeah, and we expect people to use container specific tooling for uh, allocating resources to these, these things as well. So, uh, bringing that over to what it means for Java. So, uh, we like to think that Java is uh, ideally suited for running applications in this type of environment. So, and there are many different reasons. This slide lists a few of them. Uh, it's everything from the fact that, well, after all, we have a managed language and runtime that gives you all the, the benefits of not having to care about, you know, malloc and free and pointers and uh, we do bounce checking for you and all those, those, those nice things that we've come to learn and, and love about Java. Um, we have, with the JVM, we are abstracting the exact environment you're running in, uh, both when it comes to operating systems and CPUs and all that. Um, uh, we are, John Rose mentioned earlier today, uh, the, the whole platform is a reliable one, both in terms of obviously stability, but also the fact that we value compatibility very highly. So it's a key design goal of ours to make sure that new functionality will be backwards compatible and even forwards compatible, uh, and, and really try to make sure that when you take your app and deploy it on another version of the JVM or the JDK, it will just continue to work and you'll get all the nice benefits of moving up. Um, the JVM also obviously adapts to any changes in, uh, in uh, the environment and makes sure you take advantage of whatever is in there and uh, uh, compile code as needed and all those nice things. And of course we have a very rich ecosystem built around all of this. M many different frameworks and libraries that all make this uh, a good environment to run Java in. Uh, so with all that said, we are committed to like obviously continuing with the stuff we've done, but also committed to making sure that Java is the first choice when it comes to deployments in container environments or cloud environments in general. Right. Um, how many people in here have played around with Docker? <laughs> Excellent. Uh, how many people have uh, created a uh, Docker image with Java in it? Okay, most of you. Okay, how good. Many, how many people run... Uh, in okay, good, good. So I'll, I'll go through these next few slides really quickly with just a background if you have never touched Docker before. Uh, so the point is it's super simple to create a Docker image with Java inside of it. Uh, you basically create a, create a directory structure not unlike this. You create your Docker file, you put your JDK, uh, tar DZ in there, and your application, in this case, Hello World. Uh, you create, uh, well, and I should say inside of that Docker file, uh, you select your base image. So what, uh, what operating system effectively uh, do you want to base this image on? Uh, you say, well, put the JDK inside of that, set up some environment stuff, uh, tell the, the Docker uh, image to what, what to run when it starts up. 
Uh, and then basically you go through two different steps, one of which you do ahead of time, it can be months ahead of time if you so will. Uh, it is building the actual image. Uh, so in this case, I'm building that image uh, and I'm calling it, I'm giving it a tag my slash JDK9, it could be anything. Uh, and then from that image, you stamp out individual containers uh, when you start up the application, so to speak. And, uh, and obviously, you can reuse the image across machines and again, across time as well. Um, uh, mm -hmm. yeah. So uh, when you saw the Docker file a moment ago, you have to realize that for every line in that Docker file is going to result in a new layer in the uh, composed image. And those layers can be shared and cached in well, they have to be like, composed incrementally, but the, the layers can be uh, shared around independently of each other. Um, but there is also a cost to having lots of layers, which is the overlay file system um, will impose some kind of performance and startup cost for each layer. So generally, like that three, four, five, five line Docker file is, uh, is pretty minimal. And um, there are tools as well to squash uh, your images into a single layer if that's uh, if you really like, you need that performance. So now when we know how to create Docker images, one of the things I'd like to talk uh, uh, about a bit is create, creating custom JREs. Um, so it turns out that if you take the JDK, the, the good old JDK we've been used to dealing with for a long time, uh, and you just bake that into all your Docker images, or in general into, into your deployments, uh, it can be a bit on like the large and unnecessarily large side, let's say. Uh, the whole JDK uh, weighs in at around, let's say, half a gig. Uh, it's uh, 568 megs is, I think, the JDK 9 J JDK on Linux x64. Uh, and as much as like it contains a lot of great things, you have uh, the stuff that you absolutely want, Java Lang, Java IO, NIO, uh, things like that. It also contains a lot of different things that probably you don't want. We're trying to help you not want them over time. So Corba, for example, we're trying to deprecate and remove. Uh, but that said, uh, there are, there's a lot of stuff that in there that you either don't need, or at least for some, some application, probably they're not needed. Uh, so with JDK9 uh, and with Jigsaw in JDK9, we now have the support both in terms of modules and tooling to create JREs on the fly uh, as, as you need them and for tailor-made for your application. Uh, and um, um, yeah. Um, yeah, right. In the past, we only provided you with basically one JRE. It was like the JRE, and we decided what went into that JRE specifically. But now you have the option of saying, well, I want these and these pieces. The one thing you cannot uh, exclude is java.base. That module is needed to, well, start up the JVM at all. Um, but in, in, in basically, uh, for your application, you can select freely what you want to include. And we also have tooling to help you select whatever should go into the JRE. Uh, so specifically, there's a JDEPS tool that now lives in the JDK itself. Uh, and you can point it at a class file or a jar file, uh, and it will help you spit out uh, the modules that it depends on. Um, so I, for example here, uh, this, this uh, uh, just the first few lines of running that on a tom Tomcat jar I found somewhere, and it's saying that you need java.base, java instrument, java naming. There were a few other things, but basically that's, that's it in a nutshell. Um, so creating a custom JRE is very straightforward. Uh, you use the JLink tool that Dan mentioned earlier, um, and you, uh, you give it a few options. Uh, so uh, the example there shows uh, how I'm creating a uh, JRE with only the java.base module in it. Uh, I'm basically saying create, spit out a JRE in this directory. Uh, the directory in question is my dash JRE. I'm saying pick up the modules from here. The modules live inside of the JDK. So you start out with your JDK and you say pick modules from this JDK. And I only want to include java.base. And a few microseconds later, you'll have a J JRE that is tailor-made to only include java.base. And you can run Hello World with it. It should be noted that the application, Hello World or Tomcat or whatever you're running, does not need to be modul uh, modularized or made modular aware to use this. You can create it for your own uh, old, uh, let's say, uh, job applications even before modularizing. So here's a Docker file um, using multi-stage Docker file build, which I think is a new feature since 17.6 uh, release of Docker using their release numbering system. 
Um, so this is uh, good because it lets you do the build stage stuff at the start. So we're using from Open JDK 9 as Java build, doing some JLink stuff in there. And this is where we in FN Project would encourage people to do like maiden builds and what, what have you. And then you can copy things in the second kind of stanza from the Java build. And you only end up with the, the data and layers from the second half in the actual executable image. So uh, if you're using Docker in production, for sure, look at the multi-stage build. Uh, it, does, it makes our lives easier. So what kind of benefits can you get by doing all of this? Why would you create your own GRE? Well, uh, it turns out that one of the key things is obviously size. But as Dan mentioned, there's more to it than that as, uh, as well. Uh, I'm going to talk a bit about size specifically over the next few slides. And um, the first one here uh, is showing a, a chart with three bars on it. Uh, the the largish one there is the JDK. As I mentioned, it's 560 or so megs. Uh, and again, it contains a lot of great stuff, uh, a lot of which you may not need. So the other two bars are showing what a corresponding Java.base only uh, JRE would look like. So here, this is where I've run uh, JLink, and I've said only include Java.base, and I end up with something ballpark 50 megs, which is obviously you know pretty pretty sweet um, um, savings, uh, almost like 10 times or more than 10 times even. Uh, the, it, it may well be the case that a lot of applications need more than Java.base. Uh, so as some kind of um, you know, more realistic uh, number, we've uh, created something called Netty. It's like quote Netty. Uh, it's, uh, it's a set of modules that are likely uh, for your Java applications. It's almost like likely that, that it will work if you include those modules. So it's, uh, but you know, obviously, it depends on exactly which application you have. But as you can see, we're still down like almost like 10 times smaller, 60 megs or so. So that's a pretty sweet, uh, you know, it's starting to get bearable, let's say. Uh, still a bit large if you compare to, I guess, your average C++ application or something, but then again, you get all the benefits of, of Java and the safety and all of that. Um, I should point out that the Netty bars and all of these bars, they don't contain any application. It's just the JRE itself, the, the core libraries of the JVM. So obviously, depending on what you, what you add on top of this, it will become bigger. Uh, the size can be optimized further. Uh, one of the key ways of doing that is by uh, uh, specifying a command line option to JLink called dash dash compressed, or there's a short version of it as well. Uh, and basically what that does is take some of the resources we have in the JRE uh, and compress them. Uh, so uh, it's not entirely unlikely that you'll see something ballpark 25% savings on top of uh, all of this. So you can squeeze it down even further. Yeah, there's a runtime cost to decompress. Trade, right, in the software engineer, uh, between the image size and the, the time it takes to, to start your application. Good point. Um, okay. Um, so now we've optimized the JDK or the JRE, if you so will. Uh, and it turns out that if, you, uh, if you, we now go back to and look at what a full Docker image will look like, it will look something along, along the lines of this. So on the left hand side there, I have Oracle Linux because I work at Oracle. Uh, but you know, think any Linux distribution. Uh, and obviously, you can tell that like, we can continue optimizing that uh, top 46 megs, but it's not going to make a big difference if like, the bottom thing is still the big one. right? So uh, time to start looking at what we can do on that side. Uh, and one of the things we can look at is obviously sort of in the same vein as like, using JLink on the JDK side, we can look at stripping down the Linux distribution itself. Uh, and it turns out that there's a version of the Oracle Linux Docker image uh, called the dash slim uh, version. And it's basically the, like the same thing, but stripping out everything that an application is unlikely to use. Um, and that's obviously a good thing. You know, if the application in the end doesn't need it, why include it at all? Uh, and in general, it's true, obviously, that in the world uh, like the one we have with Docker and containers, uh, you're unlikely to sort of log into your container and start managing it and running things on the command line. So as long as it runs the process and as long as it runs the application you have inside of your image, it doesn't really matter what the base image is. Uh, it, it, as long as, in our case, it runs Java, then why would we care about the exact distribution that is running on, underneath it? Yeah, so just that it's quite possible to start another container uh, on the same host that enters the same namespaces. So if you do need those debugging tools, you can start another container containing just the debugging tools and attach it to the same namespace as the one running your application. Then you can use Wireshark or uh, 
a shell even if you haven't got that in it in a small way. Right. So with that in mind, surely there must be something we can do about the, those, let's say, 100 or so megs uh, of base image. Uh, and that's where we uh, queue up Alpine Linux and the Muscle C library. So Alpine Linux is a distribution uh, that has as its tagline uh, that it's small, simple, and secure. Uh, and uh, it's basically targeting environments much like you know, the ones we're describing here with Docker and containers. Um, of, the, the, of key interest for us on the Java side is that it's using the Muscle C library. So normally on Linux you'd see the GNU C library. That's what you know. We, we don't even think about it all that much. We almost associate the GNU C library with Linux. Uh, but obviously there's nothing preventing you from running another C library. Uh, and the Muscle C library um, has that its tagline uh, that is lightweight, fast, simple, pretty, lots of different things. Uh, in the end, it should just be another C library, right? All C libraries should be the same, and you know it's a standard API and whatever it is. Uh, and that turns out to be almost true. Um, hence, we created Open Pro uh, Open JDK Project Portola. Thank you, John Rose, for the name. It comes from, by the way, the fact that Alpine Road uh, in Bay Area leads to Portola Valley. Um, yeah, ner nerds. You know yeah, exactly. We're all nerds here. Um, so uh, the, the, product is, uh, the goal of the product is to provide a port of the JDK to the Alpine Linux distribution, or more accurately, because it turns out that what's relevant for us is the Muscle C library. Uh, and I, uh, the, status, the status of the product right now is that it's sort of working. Uh, we have the code, all the changes that we know are needed uh, in the, the forest, uh, we're in the repo, uh, and it's sort of working, uh, only we haven't integrated into mainline yet, um, and I'll get back to, uh, to that in a, in a second. Uh, but basically, in a nutshell, uh, the changes needed were rel relatively straightforward. There's a lot of, uh, you know, if you have code and you've uh, only worked with a single library for a long time, then you ten tend to rely on things that are in the end library specific. In this, in our case, GNU C library specific, and a lot of it was just shaping up code so that it actually compiled uh, I happen to be the lead of this project, and I happen to be the person who made those changes. Again, they're, they're sort of straightforward. We found one latent bug in Hotspot while doing this, and that has been integrated into mainline, so, so that's sort of ready to go. Okay, the good part about Alpine Linux is that it weighs in at four megabytes, so that's pretty impressive. Basically, it is the C library and nothing else. Um, it, it does have BusyBox inside of it as well, so you do get some tools for obvious reasons, but it's very, very small. Uh, and what that means is that we can take our, you know, w whatever it is, uh, 150 or so megabytes and turn it more into 50 megabytes. And now we're starting to, I'm going to say, get to the point where, yeah, we could optimize it further, but it's starting to look pretty good. So if your if you're Go programming friends are taunting you that 50 megabytes is still enormous, uh, then, as Mark mentioned earlier, substrate VM is the thing you want to look at for stripping it down even smaller. I, uh, I had a section in here that I tore out, which is talking about the minimal VM. Uh, so there's this version of a, the hotspot JVM that only contains a, a subset of the components uh, that brings down the size of the VM from the lib JVM SO from uh, approximately 20 banks down to five. So that will save some additional space. But then you don't get all the functionality. So there's a trade-off. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I have two questions coming up on this. So the first one is, is there interest in Alpine, uh, a port to Alpine in here? Hands up. Okay, yes. bunch of hands. Second question, anybody interested in helping maintain it? Hands up. <laughs> <laughs> I tried. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah. Um, so again, uh, there are um, early access binaries um, we publish. Uh, they're they're uh, next to the normal EA binaries of 10 and all that. Uh, so please go ahead, uh, download them. If you have feedback, if you have questions, if you want this, do speak up because we, we need the feedback uh, to understand if it's worth moving forward with this. So we spoke a lot about image size. It's important uh, because Docker call is a thing. If you're running on a Kubernetes or some other management engine, you don't know exactly where your, your containers are going to start. And the image has to get from Docker Hub or wherever like to there. And even if it's already there, there's a startup cost proportional to the size of the image. Uh, to do again Docker and its fastest and popular right caches. So, right. size matters. 
that, that, I didn't mean it to come out that way. Um, okay. <laughs> Let, let's touch on a few of the features we are working on that are uh, specifically well suited to Docker, let's say. Um, the first one is something that uh, uh, a few people have already touched on, so I'm going to go through it extremely quickly, which is uh, sharing across instances. Now we've optimized the size uh, of a single instance by bringing down the size of the image and all that. What can we do to, to uh, leverage the fact that we're running multiple instances next to each other on the same machine? Uh, and on the operating system side, you already get that through shared libraries. That's the sort of standard mechanism for doing exactly that. Uh, so on the, for the JDK, we already get that uh, type of sharing with the, the shared library that makes up the JVM itself and all that. But what about Java class data and, and in general, stuff that is specific to Java, I guess. Class data sharing was already touched on, uh, but in essence, it's doing exactly that. It's taking uh, data that, that we have inside of the JVM, so data that was read from the byte, uh, uh, the class files and massaged into something that the JVM liked better. Uh, and what this uh, functionality does is to dump that data down on into a file that can then be used later to, uh, as you start up additional uh, instances. Right. And that file's around 18 meg, so if you've got like an image size versus performance trade-off, that uh, is you know, something you'll need to try. It depends on so many different things, uh, right. which, whether it's more healthy or not. Right. Uh, we, it's, it's good to point out that when we created this many years ago, uh, it was more meant for multiple processes on the same machine. But it, since Docker is in the, in the end sharing the same file systems like deep down inside, if you, put, if you cleverly put the archive in a shared image, then it can be shared across uh, different Docker containers as well. Uh, we are, yes. Uh, so quick, quick, uh, just uh, we have seen good startup time improvements. I'm no, I know Falker does, has not seen the exact same numbers, let's say, but uh, we've seen good uh, f uh, startup time reduction and also footprint savings. Uh, I'll mention quickly that we're also working on AOT, which does the same thing, but with jaded code. Uh, experimental so far, but being worked on. Uh, last part we're going to talk about is uh, how we are adding support in, in the JDK for honoring uh, the limits that you can set when you s uh, create and configure Docker containers. Uh, so uh, the JVM, obviously, as you all know, has a bunch of different ergonomics inside of it that makes, like, it looks at the environment where it's running and it's trying to size things correctly, both the heap size, the, th the number of threads, uh, you know, how th pools are set up and so on and so forth. Uh, and with Docker, it turns out that this is not transparent, uh, as in we need to do something explicitly. It doesn't just work to look at the same old numbers. So uh, a lot of work has gone in lately into making sure that the JVM is aware of these things. Right, yeah. Some patches uh, landed recently and will be in JDK 10 when it's uh, released next month. I'm all right. I'm all right. Um, so Docker allows you to uh, restrict the compute resources mainly in terms of CPU and memory. In CPU, you can have like a time-sharing, Linux kernel scheduling kind of share of what's going on, which can be burstable or not to, into like empty space. Or you can pin to a specific set of CPUs. Uh, and in the patches that Bob Bandet has uh, added to JDK 10, uh, the JVM will try its best to represent that, in both in terms of the choices that are made by e uh, ergonomics, but also to your code uh, and your library's code in runtime.available processors, uh, which is looked at by like Elasticsearch, Netty, Core, like lots of libraries will use that to size their thread pools. Uh, there's a lot more detail I wrote up uh, on this link if you want to uh, find out everything I know about. But um, what we found is that on a very large machine, starting lots of JVMs in containers was slower than starting lots of JVMs. This is JDK8, uh, I'm talking about starting lots of JVMs in virtual machines, even with the hypervisor overhead, because thread pools were being sized to the host and not to the container limit that we were trying to specify, uh, everything wanted to create 144 threads for everything, and it was, uh, it, everything just became too contended and too slow. But in JDK 10, we've done some experiments and we'll be moving to JDK 10 when it's released, uh, and this is not a problem now for us. So, uh, there's another slide as well. Oh, yes. Um, sure. You can, as they mentioned a few times, hasn't it, that heap size isn't the only memory that the JVM uses. So there's a couple of flags for uh, allocating a percentage of the uh, re container cons resource constraint that's available to you. You obviously don't want to give 100% of it to your heap because you run out of memory and everything else. 
Yeah, uh, la last slides, uh, that's on the re wandering resource limitations or limits. Uh, we've done a lot of other type of work as well, making sure that our tools, our serviceability tools, J command, JSTAC, and all those work across container boundaries as well. Uh, more work is coming. This is, as I said, we're committed to making sure that Java runs really well in containers, so uh, keep your eyes and ears open for more coming up. Thank you. Thank you very much.